Inshallah, continuing on with Rahiqul Makhtoum, page number 233, the aftermath of the martyrdom of Sayyidina Hamza Asadullah, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Now we're at bringing the situation under control. Although the death, <coughs> excuse me, although the death of Asadullah, Lion of Allah and his messenger, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, was a great loss. The Muslims maintained full control over the whole situation on the battlefield. On that day, Abu Bakr, Umar ibn Khattab, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zubayr ibn al Awwam, Mus'ab ibn Umair, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, Abdullah ibn Jahsh, Sa'ad ibn al Rabi'i, and Anas ibn al Nadr. Radiallahu anhum and others of all fought so fiercely, effectively and efficiently that they broke the strong will of the idolaters and scattered them. From his wife's lap to swords fighting and sorrows. One of the brave adventurers of that day was Hanzala al Ghazil radiallahu anhu who was Hanzala bin Abu Amir. Abu Amir was the very monk that was nicknamed Al-Fasiq, the evildoer. The saluted one, which we mentioned earlier, Hanzala, who was 20, or Hanzala, I'm sorry, who was newly married, left his wife's bed for al-jihad, fight in the cause of Allah. He set out the moment he heard the call of al-jihad. When he faced the idolaters on the battlefield, he made his way through their ranks till he reached their leader, Abu Sufyan Sakhr bin Harb, and nearly killed him. But he had been ordained to be a martyr. So at that very moment, Shahada or Shaddad bin Al Aswad reached him and killed him instead. The contribution of squad of archers to the battle. The squad or archers whom Allah's Messenger positioned at the archers' mountain had the upper hand in administering the war activities to go on in favor of the Muslim army. The Meccan horsemen, commanded by Khalid ibn al-Walid, supported by Abu Amr al-Fasiq, made three attacks against the left wing of the Muslim army with the aim of crushing it and then infiltrating into the rear to create a sort of confusion and disorder in the ranks of the Muslim army. This was what they attempted to do three times, and subsequently inflict heavy defeat on them. But thanks to the skills, quickness, and great efforts of the archers, the three assaults were countered successfully, checked each time, and were pushed back. The idolaters began to sense defeat. The battle went on and on. Firstly, with the Muslims in full command of the military theater, under the idolaters finally scattered and retreated, leaving all motives of pride and forgetting their affected dignity, with their standards trodden under the feet of the fighters, with none ever courageous or courageous enough to approach it. It seemed as if 3,000 idolaters had been fighting 30,000 Muslims and not merely several hundred. Ibn Ishaq said, Then Allah sent down his help to the Muslims and verified his promise to them. They chased the idolaters and evacuated them from their camp. No doubt it was certain defeat. Abdullah bin Zubair narrated that his father said, 
By Allah, I was watching the servants of Hind bint Utba and her women friends fleeing with their garments gathered up. No one was there to prevent us from capturing them. In another version by Al-Bara bin Azib mentioned in Sahih al-Buhari, he said we fought them, they fled, and their women could be seen fleeing in the mountains with their ankles and legs exposed. The Muslims pursued the enemies, putting them to the sword and collecting the spoils. The archers make their fatal mistake. While the small army of Islam was recording the second absolute India victory over the Meccans, which was no less in splendor and glory than the first one at Badr, the majority of the archers on the mountain side committed a fatal mistake that turned the whole situation upside down and constituted a source of heavy losses amongst the Muslims. It has almost brought about the murder of the Prophet ﷺ and left a very bad impression on the fame and dignity they deservedly earned at the Battle of Badr. We have already spoken about the position ordered given to the archers to hold on to the mountaintop, that position, whatever the course of the battle adopted, It had adopted because of that position, in other words. In spite of those strict orders and their leaders and everything that had happened, Abdullah bin Jubair warning 40 archers deserted their post. Enticed by too soon roar of victory as well as worldly greed for spoils of war. The archers, however, nine in number, or the others, however, nine in number, And Abdullah, their leader, decided to abide by the Prophet's orders and stay where they were until they were given leave or killed to the last man. Consequently, the rear of the Muslim army was left inadequately defended. Khalid ibn al-Walid cuts on to the rear. The sharp-minded Khalid ibn al-Walid sees the opportunity to turn swiftly around the rear of the Muslim army, envelop it, and encompass them. Killing Ibn Jubair radiallahu anhu and his group, they fell promptly upon the rear of the Muslims and his horsemen uttered a shout that signaled the new military developments. The polytheists returned once again to counterattack the Muslims and uh, uh, the Muslims to counterattack the Muslims. An idolatry woman called Umrah bint al Qama al Harithaya rushed to the standard lying on the earth, picked it up and raised it. The idolaters gathered around it, the standard, and called out unto one another till they encircled the Muslims and stood fast to fight again. The Muslims consequently became trapped between two barriers. Allah's Messenger وسلم, was then among a small group of fighters, nine in number at the rear of the army, watching the battle and braving the Muslim fighters. Khalid and his men took him by utter surprise and obliged him to follow either of two options, to flee for his life and abandon his army to its doomed end, or the second option, to take action at the risk of his life, rally the ranks of Muslims again and work their way through the heels of Uhud towards the encompassing army. And we shoot to the encompassed army, the genius of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his peerless and marchless courage made him opt for the second course. He raised his voice calling unto his companions, O servants of Allah. He did that though he knew that his loud voice would be heard by the idolaters before it was even heard by the Muslims. He called out unto them, risking his life in this delicate situation. The idolaters recognized him and reached his position even before the other Muslims could do so. The weakened position of the Muslims, the encompassed of the encompassment, this encirclement of the Muslims revealed three categories of people. The first group was those who were only interested in themselves and they went so mad that they actually fled. They left the battlefield and did not know what happened to the others. 
Some of this group fled as far as Medina. Some others went up to the mountains. The second group, Muslim group, was those who returned to the battlefield. So, those who returned to the battlefield but mixed up the idolaters in such a way that they could not recognize one another. Consequently, some of them were killed by mistake. That was the third group. It is stated in Al-Bukhari that Aisha radiallahu anha said that on the day of Uhud, the idolaters were utterly defeated. Iblis, la'natullahi alayhi, then called out, O servants of Allah, beware the rear, the enemy is approaching from behind. So those who were at the front turned back and fought the ones who were at behind. Then Hudayfa caught sight of his father, Al-Yaman. Al Hudayfa's father is the Al Yaman. So, about to be killed by the other Muslims. So he said, O servants of Allah, beware, this is my father. This is my father, but they did not part with him till he was killed. Hudayfa then said, May Allah forgive you. Urwa who narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha said, By Allah, from that time on, Hudayfa has always been blessed and wealthy until he died. That was because he forgave them and refused to take any blood money from his father's murder, but recommended that it be spent in charity. The Muslim group suffered from great bewilderment and disorderly, which prevailed among them from that point on. A lot of them got lost and did not know where to go. At this awkward moment, they heard someone calling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has been killed. This news made them even more bewildered and nearly senseless. The morale broke down, or almost did, in a great number of individuals. Some of them stopped fighting, slackened, and cast down their weapons. Others thought of getting in finding with Abdullah bin Ubay, the head of the hypocrites. Others thought of getting in and finding and seeking his assistance to fetch them a security pledge from Abu Sufyan. Anas bin Anad radiallahu anhu passed by those people who were shuddering of fear and panic and inquired, What are you waiting for? They said, Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been killed. What do you live for after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He has come on and died for what Allah's Messenger has died for. Then he said, Oh Allah, I apologize for what these people are doing, example the Muslims have done. And I swear it is vow of what the idolaters have perpetrated. Then he moved on till he was encountered by Sa'id ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu who asked him, Where to Abu Umar? And Asr radiallahu anhu replied, Ah, how fine the scent of paradise is. I smell it here in Uhur. He went on and fought against the idolaters till he was killed. Nobody but his sister could recognize his dead body, his dead remains. No one can really recognize his remains, and it had been cut and stabbed by over 80 swords, arrows, or spears. It was by the tip of his finger that she, after the battle, recognized him, only by the tip of his finger. Thabit bin Adda called out to his people, saying, O kinfolks, O helpers, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were killed, Allah is everlasting and he never dies. Fight in defense of your faith. Allah will help you and you will be victorious. A group of helpers joined of the Ansar as they joined him and all set out and attacked a battalion of Khalid's horsemen. He kept on fighting till he and his companions were all martyred. An immigrant passed by a helper, a muhajir by an ansar who was besmeared by blood, he said. O oh fellow, have you heard Muhammad's murder? The helper answered, if Muhammad والسلام, were killed, then he must have completed the delivery of the message. 
So fight in defense of your religion. With such boldness and encouragement, the Muslims soon recovered their spirits, came around to their senses and resisted the idea of surrender or contacting the hypocrite Abdullah bin Ubay. They took up arms and resumed the fight, attempting to make way to the headquarters, particularly after the news of the Prophet Wasallam's death had been falsified. The glad tidings strengthened their senses and their resolve and helped them to manage to break off the military blockade and concentrate their forces in an immune place to resume a relentless and fierce fight against the Mushrikeen. The third group of Muslims was of those who, care, who cared for nothing except the Prophet wasalam. So we have to go back and see because we said third, but this would definitely, this one definitely says the third group. At the head of them were notable companions like Abu Bakr, Amr bin Khattab, Ali ibn Abi Talib and others who hastened to protect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam through unrevolved devotion. The unrivaled unri- unri- vo- devotion, the battle intensified around the, the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah, as those groups of Muslims were receiving the blows of the idolaters and instantly resisting. The fight flared up around Allah's messenger who had only nine people around him. The nine bodyguards that he had around him, we have already mentioned that when the idolaters started encircling them, three were only that there encirclement that there were only nine people around Allah's messenger to body, for, as bodyguards. And that as soon as he called out to the Muslims, come on, I am the messenger of Allah. The Mushikins heard this and recognized him. So they turned back and attacked him with all their power before any of the, his other companions ran to his aid. A violent and intense struggle broke out between the nine Muslims and the idolaters, during which peerless love, self-sacrifice, bravery, and heroism were revealed. Muslims on the authority, or Muslim on the authority of Anas bin Malik narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, along with seven helpers and two immigrants, was confined to a trap when the idolaters attacked. Allah's Messenger then said, He who pushes back those idolaters will be housed in paradise, or he will be my companion in paradise. One of the helpers stepped forward and fought the idolaters in defense of the Prophet ﷺ till he was martyred. Then they attacked the Messenger of Allah ﷺ again. The same process was repeated again and again until all the seven helpers were martyred. Then Allah's Messenger said to his two Qurayshid companions, We have not done justice to our companions. The last of those seven helpers was Umrah bin Yazid bin As-Sakhan radiallahu anhu, who kept on fighting till his wounds neutralized him and he fell martyred. The most awkward hours of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam's life. After the fall of Ibn Sakhan, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam remained alone with only those two Qurayshid, according to Al-Bukhari and Muslim Abu Uthman, said at that time there were none of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions except talha ibn ubaidullah and sa'ad ibn abi waqqas radiyallahu anhuma that was the most awkward and dangerous for dangerous hour for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and a golden opportunity for the mushrikeen who had promptly took advantage of it they concentrated their attack on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and looked forward to killing him. Utbah bin Abi Waqqas pelted him with stones. One of the stones struck his face, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His lower right insular tooth was injured. His lower lip was wounded. He was also attacked by Abdullah bin Shihab 
Az-Zuhri who injured his forehead. Abdullah bin Qamiya. Qamiya means a humiliated woman who was an abstinent, strong horseman struck him violently on his shoulder with his sword. And that blow hurt Allah's messenger for over a month, though it was not strong enough to break his two pieces of armor. He dealt a heavy blow on his cheek as well. It was some strong, or it was so strong that the two rings of his iron-ringed helmet penetrated into his cheek. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take this stroke from me. I am Qamiya, he said while striking the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his sword. Allah's messenger replied, while he was wiping the blood flowing from his face, I beg Allah to humiliate you. In a narration of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, it is stated that when his incisors broke and his head was injured, he started wiping the blood off of it and saying, How can a people who cut the face of their prophet and broke his teeth, how can he who calls them to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can such people thrive or be successful who do this to one who calls them to Allah? About the incident, Allah's glory to glory be to him sent down لَيْسَ الْأَعْبَعَدَ أَوْذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ أَوْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ يُعَذِّبَهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Not for you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but for Allah is the decision. Whether he turns in mercy to pardon them or punishes them, verily they are disobedient polytheists, wrongdoers. At-Tabari states that the Prophet sallallahu said, Allah's wrath is great on those who wounded the face of Allah's messenger. He observed silence for a short while and then resumed saying, Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Which means, O oh Allah, forgive my people for they do not know. Rabbi ghfir li qawmi fa innahum zalimun. Which means again, my Lord, forgive my people, for they have no knowledge. Allahumma hadi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun was also mentioned. Which means, O oh Allah, guide my people, for they have no knowledge. It is quite certain that killing the Prophet wasallam was their primary aim. But two Qurayshid, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Talha ibn Ubaidullah showed. They showed great bravery and rare courage, and fought so fiercely and boldly that though they were only two, were able to stop the idolater short of realizing their aim. They were of the best archers and kept on fighting in defense of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger until the whole squad of idolaters was driven off of him. Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emptied his, qu- his quibble of arrows and said to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Shoot an arrow, Sa'ad. May my father and mother be ransomed for you. Prophet wasallam had never such, said such a thing about his parents except in the case of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiallahu anhu, a privilege granted to him from his efficiency in battle. In a version by... Jabir radiallahu anhu authorized by an nasai concerning the attitude of Talha ibn Ubaidullah towards the idolaters gathering around Allah's messenger when there were only some helpers with him. Jabir said when the idolaters reached him, Allah's messenger said, Who will suffice us? The evil of their evil, fight them back. Talha said, I will. Then Jabir mentioned the advice of the helpers to fight on how they were killed. One after the other, in a similar may in a similar way, the Muslims' narrations also go. When all the helpers were killed, Talha proceeded to fight as much as the other eleven ones did, till his hand was was hurt, and his fingers were cut off. So he said, "Be they cut off?" The Prophet ﷺ said, "If you had said 
In the name of Allah, the angels would have raised you up before the people's very eyes. Then he said, Allah drove the idolaters off of them. In Al-Aqil, a book of Hakim, it stated that Talha had sustained 39 or 35 wounds in his fingers and other were uh, paralyzed also. The fingers and the other uh, portion of the hand or so. Al-Bukhari in the same portion of the hand or portion of the hand. Al-Bukhari reported that Qais bin Abi Hazim said, I saw the hand of Talha paralyzed. That was because he protected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with it during the battle of Uhud. Al-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said about Talha radiallahu anhu, He who desires to see a martyr walking on the ground, let him look at Talha ibn Ubaidullah. Abu Dawood and others reported that Aisha radiallahu anhu said, anha said, whenever Uhud day was mentioned, Abu Bakr used to say, that was Talha's day. Abu Bakr recited an ayah or por- a verse of poetry about him. O Talha bin Ubaidullah, paradise is for you as water springs are do for deer to drink from. For the deer to drink from. At the awkward end, most Delicate circumstances, Allah's glory to him sent down his invisible help. In Zahir al-Buhari, in Muslim, it is reported that Sa'ad said, I saw Allah's messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on a hood day with two men, dressed in white, defending him fearlessly. I have never seen similar to them, neither before Uhud nor after it. In another version, he means to say that they were Jibril and Mikail. All those events happened in no time. If the Prophet Sallallahu elite companions had realized the grave situation, immediately they would have rushed on to the spot and would have let him sust- and, and would not have let him sustain these wounds. Unfortunately, they got there after Allah's Messenger Sallallahu had been wounded, and six of the Prophet Sallallahu personal bodyguards had been killed already martyred. The seventh was severely wounded and desperately fighting in defense of the Prophet ﷺ. However, as soon as they arrived, they encircled the Messenger of Allah ﷺ with their bodies and weapons and were alert enough to prevent the enemies from reaching him ﷺ. The first one who returned to give help was his companion of the cave of Bakr al-Siddiq. In a version by Aisha radiallahu anha recorded in Ibn Hisham Sahih, she narrates that Abu Bakr Siddiq said on the day of Uhud when all the people had left the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I was the first to go back and see him. Before him, I saw a man fighting in a shield with from or shielding him from the enemies. I said to myself, I wish you were Talha. Let my father and my mother be ransomed for you. O oh Allah, let him be Talha. Let my parents be ransomed for you. On the way, I was overtaken by Abu Ubaidah bin al-Jarrah, who was then moving as swiftly as a bird. We both rushed to the to dress the Prophet sallallahu to address the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wounds. There, we found Talha suffering from serious wounds before Allah subhanahu wa taala's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. See to your brother, for he is more in need. I noticed that two rings of, of armor, of iron armor of the helmet, had penetrated Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa cheek. So I set out to take them out. But Abu Ubaidah demanded, By Allah, O Abu Bakr, I request that you let me do it myself. Fearing to hurt the Prophet, he started pulling one of the two rings out very slowly and carefully with his mouth. Then he pulled the arrow out by the mouth, or he pulled out the mare by the mouth too. Consequently, his front tooth came out. Then I proceeded up to pull the second out, but Abu Ubaidah requested me to leave it to him again. Oh, Abu Bakr, he said, I beg you by Allah to let me do it again. He pulled the second ring very slowly and carefully with his mouth. 
till it came out, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, See to your brother, for he is in more in need. We approached Talha to tend to him, but found that he had some ten sword wounds in his body. This showed how efficiently Talha had fought and struggled on that day. At that awkward and critical moment, of a group of Muslim heroes gathered around the Prophet wasallam, forming a shield to protect him from the idolaters. Some of them were Abu Dujana Mus'ab bin Umair, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Sahl bin Hunayf, Malik bin Sinan, the father of Abu Sa'id al-Qudri, Um al-Qudri, Ummu Umara, Nusayba bin Kab al Mazainiya Khatada bin al Nu'man, Omar bin al Khattab, Hatib bin Abi Balta'a, and Abu Talha radiallahu anhum. The idolaters increased the intensity of the battle, the number of idolaters was steadily increasing, and in their, in their attacks naturally got severer. The drive increased to an extent that Allah's Messenger وسلم, fell into one of the holes dug in and designed by Abu Amir Fasiq to be used as traps, with his knees wounded. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu helped him by giving him a hand up. Talha bin Ubaidullah radiallahu anhu helped him until he could stand upright. Nafi bin Juwayd said, I heard, I heard an, a muhajir say, I have witnessed the battle of Uhud and watched arrows being hurled from all directions at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of them hit him. Abdullah bin Shay, Shiba al-Zuhri said, Guide me to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Allah if I don't kill him. I would not want to live. Although Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was next to him alone, but he did not see him. Safwan, another mushrik, blamed him for not attacking him, but Abdullah swore that he did not see him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and added that he might be immune to their attempts on his life. He also said that four of them pledged to make a fresh attempt and kill him, but to no avail. Inshallah, we will stop here with the military career of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaking on the Battle of Uhud. It is actually a lengthy uh, battle compared to Badr now that we are finding. But Inshallah, we are looking forward to uh, getting the questions answered about the Prophet Alaihi uh, Wasallam's life. Uh, the three questions, main, namely, being how old was the Prophet ﷺ when his father passed away? Second question: uh, How old was the Prophet ﷺ? How old was the Prophet ﷺ? Excuse me, when his mother passed away. That's the second question. And finally, the final question is: What were the circumstances around the Prophet ﷺ's passing? What were the circumstances of the Prophet ﷺ's passing? Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.